Welcome to Zorba Zorb Gaming, my name is Lachlan Linton Keen and welcome to the second instalment of our Edoras Gaming Board. Today we're going to be making the second half of the Lower City, which is going to focus on the inner city inside the Palisade Wall. So we've got lots of juicy Rohan buildings and all sorts of stables and taverns and really cool stuff. Uh, it's going to be a fun day. So I'm going to take you through the whole build process from designing the buildings right through to you know, building the main structures, detailing the interiors, and of course the board itself with all our beautiful little grass tufts. So it's going to be a pretty cool video with showing a, a fair few techniques. Uh, obviously with this whole process we always start with conceptual design, so I spent a fair bit of time designing how the stables are going to function and the tavern and the general buildings. Uh, the, the board is specifically designed with uh, a battle company scenario in mind where uh, Rohan townsfolk must fight off a raiding party, so the buildings that have been designed are pretty key for objectives. So they're, they're all pretty unique, which makes for a nice kind of diverse board as well. But I'm also going to uh, build the board to facilitate uh, multiple types of play. Uh, so the buildings will be removable so that we can take them and use them in other boards, as well as able to sort of swap them around to some extent to get different layouts for replayability. Uh, so it should be pretty cool. Now, in terms of materials, our board is exactly the same as the first half of our Edoras board. Uh, with basing in 5mm masonite and our body will be extruded polystyrene. Uh, this will actually be two layers thick because of course we've started to slope up with the first half of the board and then we'll continue that slope as well and, and end up being about three layers thick at the back of the board which should be pretty cool to keep that graduated hill. Um, material wise for the buildings themselves we're just going with our wonderful balsa wood. I've got scores of different shapes and sizes here. Some of it is kind of the classic balsa, some of it's a bit more, uh, it's almost like small structural pine um, for these thinner rods just to lend a bit more structural rigidity uh, to the overall build structures. Uh, we're also going to be using a little bit of 3mm MDF um, which is great for sort of basing small things, but you'd never want to use it for basing large stuff because it's got so much flex. Um, but for the buildings themselves, particularly because they're going to have floors and they're going to be, uh, you know, accessible and fully interiored, uh, being, you know, they need to have some sort of support structure and they're not just being glued straight down onto the foam base. Uh, so yeah, the MDF will go down and then our timber will go up around that. So that'll be the bases of our buildings, which will be quite nice. And we're also going to, you know, use a bit of uh, the old teddy bear fur because we'll have some thatch throughout the place, which you can see this is an old, uh, Rohan dwelling I made oh, probably six years ago, so it was pretty crap. Um, we might end up repurposing this guy, giving him a repaint and a redetail, and having him in the back somewhere. We'll see how we go if we run out of time before our battle companies meet to get all the buildings finished. Um, but that's the kind of vibe, you know, the whole beautiful sort of medieval house look, that Viking Norse kind of feel, and, and the teddy bear fur. Uh, works quite well for thatch. This hasn't got a, a very nice paint to it, but you can sort of get an idea of the finish. So we'll be doing a bit of that as well. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty great little board really. We've got more grass work to do. Uh, we had a lot of fun making the tufts for the first half of the board. If you guys haven't seen that, I'll obviously put the link in the description, but there's so much beautiful tuft work on that lower section. And we'll be carrying those uh, that color palette of tufts through uh, the upper board as well, particularly you know, uh, getting all those little grasses coming in around the edges of roadways and the edges of buildings just to really kind of mesh our buildings into the environment and add that extra level of realism. But any, I think the, the best place for me to start is I'm going to get a few of these uh, polystyrene sheets gluing and then while that's happening well, I'll start to jump in and design our first building. Maybe the tavern, maybe the stable? Let's go find out. Alright, so I've done the preliminary designs on the interior of Edoras. We're going to have four kind of major buildings. Uh, one is just going to be that small old Rohan building that I'll repurpose and give a bit more life. Uh, which means we're going to have three kind of major construction builds for the interior. Now, uh, because of our scenario that we're playing, we're going to have three very different buildings that all have a kind of a unique flavour, not just for the scenario, but for the board as well. Uh, the first one is going to be a, uh, a wonderful stable with a, a two-tier roof in that classic longhouse uh, kind of fashion and we're going to have a nice like some stalls and stuff interior on the inside uh, so that should be quite a cool uh quite open and engaging board and, and that'll probably sit in the middle at least for the scenario uh, and that'll be a, a nice focal point for all movement of the board to kind of move through and around. Uh, and then up in the uh, the bottom right hand corner we're going to have our tavern which is that classic longhouse look, uh, a big long sort of beautiful you know golden thatch roof, we'll have a little awning off to the side and that guy's going to be on a stone plinth 
uh, just to kind of elevate him and, and separate some of the buildings. We'll have essentially we'll have two on stone plinths and two that are just timber straight into the ground to kind of give a bit of bit of flavour amongst the buildings. And our third and final is going to be the Edoras Armory, at least for the lower gate section. And uh, that's going to be quite a cool building, more of a complex build than the other two. Uh, have a bit of verticality built in. We'll have some tower infrastructure coming out of the top of the roof and some stairwells to get up and down. And he's going to go up in the back corner of the board, sort of at its furthest point away from the gatehouse and, and that gives us a good mix of our verticality in different spots because obviously we've got some height added with the gatehouse itself and now we'll have some extra little sniping spots for our Rohan defenders back up the hill which should be quite cool I think. Uh, so that one's probably what I'm going to tackle first because it's got a few interesting build elements. It gives me a good chance to work out all the different techniques that will map across the other two builds. He's also going to be on a stone plinth which we'll be using a, uh, a one inch thick section of extruded polystyrene and we'll jump onto that in a sec. Uh, and then we've got all our timber walls, our teddy bear fur thatch, uh, and it gives us a good chance to work into some cool stairwells and some cool forms as well. So we'll jump into that. Um, our first kind of job, I guess, is to prepare our stone plinth, because it's the first element of the build, and then we'll, uh, we'll move uh, kind of up from there, essentially. Um, there's kind of different ways that you can build the walls of the buildings. You can either go straight into the base with, with uh, you know, the timber elements, or you can sort of mock up the building out of corboard and then glue timber finishings to that. Uh, so we'll probably use a mix of different techniques. Because this guy is a bit more of a complex shape, uh, in terms of the tower and, and all that sort of extra design elements, the kind of different roof lines and, and as the tower progresses, I'll probably use the uh, foam core board mock-ups technique and then glue timber cladding, uh, just because it's a lot easier to mock shapes up with just a bit of core board. It doesn't take very long, you can adjust it very easily and then we can go, right, that's going to look very cool. Now, this whole foam process, we kind of had a bit of a look at it in the last video. It's not too involved, it's pretty fun actually, it does take a little bit of time. Um, it's better to use a ballpoint pen when we're making our stonework because the ballpoint rolls over the foam uh, um, It gives it a, a more of a smooth finish and just like when you're cutting if you're using a pencil Sometimes it can grab and tear the foam. So on our top We're gonna have our flagstones, you know broad flatter sort of stones that all interlink and then on our sides Our stones will be a little bit more structural and a little bit thinner uh, So we'll just jump straight in essentially now you don't have to get too mental about it Don't go too crazy just it's, it's it takes you know takes long enough you don't need to be really kind of OCD about getting the perfect stones you just got to make sure they look realistic enough rounded corners no odd shapes um, and any any odd shapes that are created by the way you're joining different flagstones just round them off and and make sure nothing looks too square nothing looks too circular just draw rocks basically So I finished the stone plinth, which is going to be the base of our building. We've got some nice broad flagstones across the top and that thinner stuff, those nice thin, more structural uh, stone on the sides, which has come up quite nice. Our next phase is to start mocking out uh, the kind of building walls with uh, five millimeter foam core board. Uh, and then we'll go in and we'll start cladding all of our timber once that's done. So I've got myself here some, this is just a hundred mil high because that's how much I've worked out uh, that's how high I've worked out my walls are going to be and now what I need to do is just make the first four main walls And then we'll start to go into some detail from here I've picked a little spot uh, on our side panel where our door's going to go So we'll have a, another little rocky plinth that comes out here uh, about 12 centimeters wide And I just did a little bit of a uh, math there to work out I know our stairwell's going halfway up the wall before it juts inside uh, So it'll finish about there that gives us enough room to be clear of the door uh, so up next, we're just going to start gluing our frame together. We just come in with our hot glue gun, who is, yeah, probably warm enough. Uh, we'll get some more glue though. If you're going to get serious about uh, making terrain, buy yourself a cordless hot glue gun. They are amazing. And we just get, press that together, press and hold for a little bit. You can use the base uh, just to give you a guide to make sure that you're gluing square. But as you can see, that is looking pretty nice.
So I've gone as far as I can go with our foam core board structure before I need to start adding timber cladding. Uh, it was actually a bit trickier than I thought it was going to be. This sort of back section with our tower and working out how all of that was going to function. Uh, I've had to keep this removable because obviously we're going to need to be able to get inside to the full space of the armory uh, within the actual building. Uh, so having that kind of lock in place and as we add the timber cladding, I'll have to just make sure that it's all still locking and removable is still working. Uh, these will be our top roof plinths and our, our roof will go on top of that as always with uh, all of the Rohan buildings that we'll be building. So that won't be too bad. I did have to move the back door across to the side, which I'm not too unhappy about because it creates a sort of different dynamic and encourages you to move through that back space and that'll work quite well with the way the uh, the rocky outcrop is going to function on the board anyway so I think that could be quite interesting. There's also going to be another wraparound veranda here and another stairwell coming down that side but all of that section will be balsa and that'll be one of the final build elements added. So up next it's on to our timber cladding. So just like the gatehouse in the last video, we're going to be using a lot of balsa wood of varying thicknesses and coffee stirrers as our primary construction and finishing material. Uh, for the armory here, we're going to be using uh, two millimeter balsa wood to be our primary paneling material and we'll create uh, longitudinal uh, panels kind of going down this way I think and then we'll use either slightly thicker set balsa or perhaps coffee stirrers to kind of create a few sort of uh, breaks in the panel and add that extra layer of detail and then for our, all our big detail pieces like our corner work and our cross beams we'll use either the big sort of square postings or uh, all that you know really nice five to seven millimeter balsa pieces to create those big heavy structural beams. So I've glued all the 2mm balsa onto our external panels using hot glue uh, and now we're going to work into the balsa and create our timber panelling texture. Now if you're building the structure just out of balsa wood, you're not using the core board structure first, it's often better to pre-texture all of the balsa before you assemble the uh, all the different pieces. Uh, when we come to building the stable, that's the technique I'm going to use because as that's more of a rustic building rather than something less solid than an armory or a tavern, uh, that's going to be just a, a, a thinner timber build rather than the core board structure like these big meaty buildings. But for this, we've got a great surface to work on. We can glue straight onto the core board and we can start working straight into it. So it's pretty simple. It's very similar to our extruded polystyrene actually. I'm just going to take a ruler and use uh, my pencil. I find that pencil works better on balsa. Something about the slipping graphite works really nicely with the wood grain. And we're always going to work with the grain and we're just going to slowly carve in our panel texture. You can adjust the thickness or the thinness of your panels. You can do whatever you like. If you want panels that are going vertically, you obviously just glue the wood grain in a different direction. We can also come in and, uh, and just do a few lighter lines through uh, the actual panels themselves rather than the grooves just to give that timber a little bit more extra texture. Now that the first panel that we did was just one big panel. Obviously you can see as I'm running out of balsa wood on this side I've glued lots of little different size bits but uh, that doesn't really matter because you know we're carving panels and, and all sorts of things so they just sort of function all the joins of the timber just become part of your panelling. It also gives you different textures of, of balsa wood as you're using different brands and different thicknesses, uh, which just adds you know, more of that natural variation, as Shane Warne would say. We've started to do the top flooring sections of our kind of tower, and the sort of trickiest part now is to start working on these stairs, uh, which essentially are just small little pieces uh, of, uh, of thinner balsa, which I then tack together with a few glue spots and then we just slide them down in and glue them in and, uh, and the whole, that's effectively 
the whole purpose of that angled piece of cardboard is to allow us to just kind of have that simple gradient steps of, uh, of balsa wood and it gives us a nice looking staircase. So I finished all of the panelling now, as you can see I've got all of the interior done as well as the last few uh, detail bits in and around the place and up in the elevated section. Uh, which is coming together quite nicely when it all locks together but the thing that makes the kind of timber work really pop is all of those elevated details that sit out from the panelling. So to do that we're going to uh, use strips of different balsa wood thicknesses uh, to create kind of that relief detail that sits out from the main panels. So we've got lots of options with this sort of stuff. You can use kind of nice square rod to ping off the corners and then work in from there with all sorts of things but uh, I'm going to do a lot of that when we come to the tavern so I think to keep this one different I'm just going to use some nice 3 mil balsa which is a really nice uh, thicker set balsa that looks really cool. So that's kind of where that's shaping along. I'll go through and keep smashing out all the rest of the details along the sides. We'll go through here, we'll go through here, a bit of detailing around the back and uh, especially on these corners and all that triangle shapes will give them a little bit of detail as well. So the construction of our armory is nearly finished. I've put through all the balustrades and finished off all the stairs and I've started working on the roof. That's got one more stage to go and then it's finished. And I've also done the most important stage of all, which is the kind of timber finishing. And I've gone through and, and taken a scalpel and a, and a dremel in some cases and just carved and scored into the softer wood and then dremeled into the harder wood to uh, really give a lot more kind of character and flavor to each of the individual timbers. Little nicks, all that kind of aging, the timber knots, all that sort of detail that just really brings the timber work to life. And now all we've got left is to put our roof on and our thatching. So with our thatching, we just use the classic teddy bear fur, which is just, you know, you can get that from your normal fabric, uh, fabric store. These are a few pieces that I've begun to cut to size. So we'll just move this fellow over here and I'll take you guys through this process. It's super simple, but it's really effective. Uh, and it's, oh, it just gets such a great look. So what we want to do is uh, cut our sheets of teddy bear fur so that they've got a little bit of overlap over the top join because when we put them together, we'll use that to create a, a little bit of a ridge and, and play around with the fibers to make it mesh quite nicely. Uh, another important thing when we're cutting is when we're cutting this bottom section, to make it kind of get a, a, as much overhang of fur as we can without the minimum of the base, what we want to do is pull the fur back on itself and take the hessian matting out from under it. So you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I don't cut the fibers so the fibers stay long and hang down over the matting. So you can really tease it out as well once you've taken that under edge off and as you can see it's hanging right over now. We've got a nice little, a nice gap and if you compare that to a, a kind of classic hard edge it's incredibly different very different, it looks a lot better. So that will now sit as our overhang and he'll go down like that and he'll go across like that. So in terms of application, it's pretty simple. We just use uh, two different types of PVA glue, pure 100% PVA we use to apply uh, our teddy bear fur to the cardboard base and then we'll come over and treat the whole thing in a 50-50 PVA water mix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut my second piece of fur and then we are going to glue them down. So pure PVA on our underside and make sure you apply it quite thickly because the mesh uh, underlay of the teddy bear fur really soaks up the fur. So to get a good bond, uh, we, we really want to kind of lay it on thick. And we'll carry a little bit over to the other side as well because we are gonna create a bit of a lip at the top. So we'll make sure that there's plenty of glue that to get stuck into. Beautiful. 
and now starting to kind of roughly position it off the bottom. I'm going to mess this up because I'm trying to make sure you guys can see. And the great thing is, it's, you know, it's not like hot glue or anything. It's super positionable. You've got plenty of working time. And we just want to make sure we've got enough hanging down that we're really covering that edge. And, you know, we'll, we'll wrap her around a little bit as well because, you know, gravity is a thing. As light as that is. Alright. Beautiful. Just give that a nice press down. And then what I like to do is, once that's there, is just come in and just fucking stick a whole lot of PVA right at that top bit again. And really smash that down. It's so fun to pat. The next trick is we want to treat the entire uh, fur with a big coat of PVA. So we're going to use a 50-50 mix of PVA and water. So I'm just going to pour my PVA in first. Um, you don't have to be too precise, it's fairly bucket all of this. Yeah, that looks good. It's actually probably about 33%, you know, a third water, two thirds PVA is probably more on the money. Give it a good mix so it's nice and blended. There we go, that's looking fantastic. And then we just want to paint all of our fur with the mixture. Now you'll pull a fair bit of fur off, that's not an issue. This is just going to essentially allow us to set the fur and you know, as the PVA dries, the fur will dry nice and hard and uh, it'll give it you know, protection, longer life, allows us to uh, get a, a stronger structure to, to paint and, uh, and sets all of the fibres in place so that when we're moving them around and when we spray them later, no loose fibres, well, fewer loose fibres get exposed. So our final step is now to take a steel ruler and just drag it across the teddy bear fur and kind of bring that flat profile back into a kind of textured surface because we really want that the, all the fibres to be showing and to give us something to hit the paint when we're dry brushing. So we'll, uh, we'll just move back and forth and don't worry if it gets all too curly because you can always just straighten stuff up again by going the other direction. It's particularly important up here around the seam uh, where we've got our teddy bear fur layers blending because we can really get in there and, and use the, the breaking up of the fibres to hide that join and, uh, and to make the crest of the house look really nice as well. So you can certainly see the difference with what we begin with, just that kind of smooth, shiny teddy bear stuff to this really kind of gritty, textured surface. So now we'll leave that to dry, uh, probably about 6 to 12 hours. If you get it in the sun, it'll dry faster. And now we'll hit everything with an undercoat of spray paint and get into painting. So we've effectively got three elements when it comes to the painting scheme. We've got our timber work, which is a scheme of graduated browns. We use a bit of burnt umber, burnt sienna, and then we bring in a, a bone highlight. And we kind of use blends of those, uh, those different colours to create a series of steps. And, uh, and that gives a nice kind of graduated toning to the timber. We've got our stone plinth, which is just some graduated greys, moving from kind of a, a darker, more blue grey up towards something like fortress grey, uh, which gives it a nice kind of highlight. And then we put a bone, bit of bone through that as well to kind of really tie the stone into that Rohan rural look. And then we've got the thatch as well, which is in that same world, we've got a lot more yellow and gold pushed through into the base layers, and then we move off to bone as well. So the way that we use the kind of uh, our highlights, our shadows and our mid-tones is we keep them all in the same plane of kind of the same sphere of colour throughout the uh, all the different elements and then I've got that unifying bone highlight which really brings the whole piece together. So the first thing I'm going to tackle is the timber work because uh, that allows me to just go crazy and it doesn't matter if I get uh, paint all over the stonework and then I can come back in and clean that up with the first grey undercoat and, uh, and then I'll do the thatch last as a separate element. So my very first coat for the timber is just hitting it with uh, some burnt umber which is quite close to uh, the uh, October brown undercoat, uh, but it just gives it a little bit of toning and kind of fills out the sort of uneven splotchiness that we get from our spray paint. I'm gonna need a fair bit more than that. So uh, obviously brush wise, I've got quite a few different brushes that I operate. This is my huge, massive, uh, what have we got? This is a four inch, uh, and I use that for really fine detail. It's just basically dust dry brushing uh, on the final layers. The, the stock workhouse is the two inch flat, and then uh, we use our one inch to kind of get in around those corners, particularly with the stonework. So I'm going to take my two inch and just get a fair bit of paint on there. I'll take the excess off. Now you don't have to be too worried about um, having too much paint on the brush for this stage, because essentially 
where uh, we're looking to put down a fair bit of paint. You know, it's not a huge issue if, uh, if you're applying large chunks because this is effectively a secondary base coat. So I've worked through all my shadow and mid-tone browns uh, using a combination of burnt umber and burnt sienna. I started off with our burnt sienna, then about 50-50 of each, and then moving to a, a mix that's almost all burnt sienna. And you can see it just giving our timber a nice kind of graduated undertone. And now we're going to start bringing in our bone. So I've got a bit of a slurry of paint left over here that's probably a, about 70% burnt sienna and 30% burnt umber. Now what I'm going to do is just drop about the same amount of paint, so we've got a 50-50 mix of bone. So with these highlight layers, you don't have to be too crazy with them. We only need a tiny little bit of paint. You know, we're getting very much towards our uh, high dry brushing stage of things. We just want to start to bring out the details. Now one technique that's kind of important to note here is I'm not allowing any drying time between all the layers. It's effectively a kind of large scale form of wet blending where we're using heavy dry brushing to uh, push over layers that are uh, not completely dry themselves. So all the paint kind of starts to blur together and, and kind of create all these really nice naturally graduated tones. You can see a really good example of that here as I start to bring on the balustrade. You know, you can't see where the mid-tones start and the shadows begin uh, because they're all still fairly damp and they're just naturally blending together and creating a really nice kind of basis for our, our wood surface. For our final highlight layers, I'm going to move to my big 4-inch brush. And that's kind of, because I've been wet blending with this brush constantly, it's so clogged with all the different colours, I want to be able to get quite a pure highlight. So I'm going to start again with my, uh, my almost 100% bone. Because uh, as you can see, even though we were using a lot of bone last time, it blends really nicely because of all the paint on the brush. And now we really want to start to work those top highlights. But, you know, really lightly, yeah? That's the kind of the benefit of the huge brush is that you don't have to apply a lot of force and you can get just a nice dusting. It's also really fast, which is very satisfying. There we go, that's a great example. Really starting to hit the front there. Get that beautiful bone highlight. Getting into that timber, that really pine colored timber is where we're going. The stairs and, and all the balustrades are always so easy because there's so much texture there to pick up the paint. So now with our final dry brush highlight, which is 50% white, 50% bone, that real kind of bleach bone tone, it's absolutely imperative that we take like 95% of the paint off the brush. So when you're clearing your brush, make sure you're hitting it from all angles because you'll find that paint often hides in little pockets. There we go. Sometimes you might need to reapply and then rebrush to make sure that you've got your top colour sitting there. Alright, now I'll just bring this in. And you just want to be really light. Before we apply any washes to our timber work, I'm going to put down the first few layers of base coats and highlights on our stone plinth, uh, starting off with a nice deep kind of bluey grey, uh, which we can sort of have a look here, looks pretty awesome. And then we'll uh, hit that with the next kind of layers of graduated grey, and then we'll wash the whole thing as a unit. For our thatch, we want to bring a lot more yellow into the scheme, and it's really important to do that at the base layer, and, uh, and really get that yellow in from the beginning, and then you can kind of keep it going through the palette as you move up. So I'm going to start with just this really sandy kind of gold, and uh, just go straight in there on top. You don't have to be too crazy about it. We, we, want to get it uh, we want to get it on there pretty thick. This is effectively going to be our base coat and then you know we'll have just those little peaks of brown coming through from our, our total undercoat. Let's just give it 
a bit of definition, but as you can see, that's pretty, pretty sandy. That should give us a good place to work up from and keep that yellow in the undertones. Make sure you work across the grain as well, not just with the grain, to really get into those deeper grooves. Alright, that looks pretty good. So now we'll keep a bit of that yellow there and bring a little bit of our bone in. And start to mix the next highlight. So it's a similar sort of technique um, as to the wet blending we used on the timber surfaces, but we don't have to worry about taking so much of the paint off in between coats on this because we've got so much texture on the fur. Look at that, look at the way it just blends straight in. Definitely not an issue at all. And in these early stages particularly, we can afford to be really thick. So now I'm just gonna give everything a wash. It's really key for the timber because it knocks back all of the bright paint elements and, and kind of gives it a nice weathered age look. And, and the same for the thatch. It kind of helps improve that kind of graduated tones through the, uh, through the roofing and, uh, and it kind of knocks all of the, the gray mutedness back from our stones. And then it allows us a stage to go back and kind of dry brush another highlight and just get a really nice graduation of color. So the armory is finished and I'm really stoked with how it's turned out. I love all the different build elements and the way the designs come together, especially the staircases. I think that's going to facilitate some really cool gameplay. I can just see some Rohan Royal Guard shielding as Uruk's advance up the sides and we've got arches down here raining down, so it should be pretty cool, I think. Good for gaming and good for the board as well. It should kind of be a nice focal point to sit nice and high up the prow of the hill, um, as well as being a nice, uh, a nice building to use on other boards, uh, kind of any sort of Rohan village, it adds a little bit of fortification to that kind of board that doesn't have something like the Palisade Wall, so it's a really good jack of all trades and I think it should be fun to play on. Now it's on to the rest of the interior of Edoras. So up next is the stable, which is an important building in any Rohan township, especially in the heart of the Edoras interior. It sits in the center of the board and it's a great place for objective gameplay with all the horses in their stalls, and it also features some great design elements which really set it apart from the rest of the buildings. So to start off with, we're gonna work up from our MDF base, which I've just measured to size after doing all the, the preliminary designs, and cut out to kind of have a nice smooth shape, uh, so it kind of nestles in nicely with the ground around it. I beveled all of the those edges and then spent a fair bit of time marking out the design perfectly in pencil on the base so that I could build straight up from that MDF structure. Unlike the armory, the stable doesn't have a foam core board center that is then clad with timber paneling. It's made exclusively from timber sheets. This means that I have to pre-texture them before I assemble the building's walls and build them piece by piece straight down onto the MDF base. That's why it's so important that the base of this particular building is so rigid and strong because it can't have very much flex at all, otherwise we risk the structural integrity of the whole building. The structure of the roof was made using cordboard and features a couple of small roof lines as we have smaller rooms jutting out to the side, one an entry and one as an extra stable berth, which just creates for some interesting shape and a bit of dynamic gameplay, adding an interesting little opening that can be held and defended by some troops. This cordboard structure was then finished with timber edging and of course we then apply our classic teddy bear fur. The painting scheme of the stable is almost identical to the armory, the only difference being that the thatch is a slightly different colour. I made this choice to just sort of hint at all the different variety of materials and building periods that has taken place. This city has a lot of history and certain buildings were built at certain times and not everything would be exactly uniform, so having a few little points of difference just helps to give the board a lot of character. The tavern is another important building in any Rohan landscape, so I chose to use a really classic longhouse design with that L shape and a small room jutting off to the left. This creates another point of entry and also gives me an opportunity to create a stepped stone plinth for the base, which kind of gives a little bit of uh, elevation and sets it up away from the hillside. The timber cladding has a very different style to the armory to really set it apart and give it a kind of unique character. Instead of long, longitudinal panels, I used lots of upright coffee stirrers and different bits of balsa of different thicknesses set alternating in a pattern. And that kind of gave a really interesting texture whilst also accentuating the height of this strong Viking longhouse, which would be a real figure sitting out on the hillside for all of the townsfolk. 
The painting scheme is exactly the same, but because of the slightly different construction techniques with the vertical panels instead of the long longitudinal cladding, the paint kind of takes to the building in different ways. We get different highlights hitting different areas, and once again it really gives the building a kind of unique character that sets it apart on the hillside from all the other Rohan buildings and just adds to the overall character of the cityscape itself. the base for the interior of Edoras uh, that's ready to be painted essentially. We've got our October Brown undercoat on with our Design Master spray. Uh, the surface itself has been prepared just as, uh, as we prepared the first half of the board in the last video. It's uh, extruded polystyrene. Of course we're starting from the double thickness this time because the, the hill is sloping up. And then I've got uh, more polystyrene up here that I've carved my rock face into and started to kind of work the slope up the mountain. Uh, I've put all the texture on with a combination of texture paint and primarily wood putty and uh, there's a, a few little gravel features, particularly in, in areas that there's a, a lot of pathway and movement. I've left most of the regions where buildings are gonna go just with a fairly flat texture, so it still takes paint and looks good, but it won't get in the way of, of placing things. So it should be pretty sweet. Uh, in terms of my color palette, we've got just our graduated browns that are gonna go down, and that kind of dark brown with bleach bone highlight that's going to favor the road to make that really stand out. And we'll get a bit of green mottled through these hills as well uh, to kind of provide a bit of a basis of toning before our static grass goes down. So painting's finished, the cliffs have come up really well. Um, our bleach bone kind of path tone works really nicely, so now it's on to doing our static grass clumps and then applying our main body of static grass. I'm gonna primarily focus our clumps and grasses around these kind of hilly sections and I'll leave most of this area fairly bare because at the moment the way we're playing it, buildings will be going down on top of it, particularly tufts, they're gonna get in the way and just get damaged. So we'll focus around the edges of the path and up through the mountain to kind of really bring the mountainside to life. So I'm using the same palette with all of my tufts and grasses as we did on the first half of the board, the Edoras Gatehouse. Uh, so we've got here the six millimeter patchy, the 10 millimeter patchy, uh, the 10 millimeter wild meadow, which is sort of the staple of the tufts and then the 10 millimeter spring. Now obviously in terms of palette, the spring, we've got a bit more of a greener yellow. The wild meadow is sort of that kind of classic Rohan steppe, Mongolia golden yellow. And then uh, the patches are a bit browner and a bit darker just to give us, you know, shadows, midtones, highlights, you know how this works. So um, essentially the process that we had last time was that I would use the six millimeter tufts up through the road because that's the area that gets trampled the most. So the grasses are shorter and uh, areas that uh, get more uh, kind of water have a bit more greenery in them which is more chlorophyll so that's where the spring sort of favors and anywhere that's under structure kind of ridge lines i opted for the kind of darker grasses because they, they that species likes growing around rock apparently or so i have decided so that's the kind of way i like to frame the whole process is to think about it really organically and kind of develop a bit of a structure rather than randomness and it helps to add that extra level of realism so, uh, I'm going to start with a few of our 6mm ones and we'll kind of start by laying out a bit of the stuff around the road and then I'll spread out from there. Most important thing we need is our tweezers, they are fucking essential, um, and our PVA. Now, a lot of these guys are, you know, they claim to be self-adhesive, but ignore that. The self-adhesion is basically just enough to hold the grass together. You always want to be PVAing them down. So they pluck off, you know, pretty easily. Boom, comes off. Obviously you can use your tweezers. And then we just dunk it in a bit of glue. We don't want it to be too much glue because I always get like a bit of a PVA bubble which can get a bit shiny. Um, and then we just, oh, see, fucking like that. That's way too much PVA. And then we just stick them in and we go from there. We just keep on smashing them out. Now, some of these uh, shorter tufts have a bit of an angle on them, uh, which is sort of, sort of like a manufacturing fault, I guess, but it can be really useful because you can put them up slopes and it looks like they're growing towards the sunlight. So that's often something I like to make use of when they uh, when the tufts get a little directional. So the most important thing really is just to think about where your tufts are going and why they're going there, making sure your shorter tufts are going in the more travelled areas. But aside from that, just kind of go crazy and have a bit of fun. It's really, really awesome to put together. 
such a satisfying feeling. All the tufts going down, it's really cool. This guy's a bit more rounded. Uh, he's not as directional, so I'll use him on a flatter surface. He can be a little uh, in the walkway kind of tuft. Now obviously I'm not going to put any tufts in these flat areas as I said before, because that's where all the buildings are going to go. Uh, so I'm going to prioritise all of the areas that are kind of really dressable and won't be covered by buildings. Um, and also, like, I mean, depends on where you get them from, but tufts can be pretty expensive, so you really want to put put your money where your mouth is and uh, and put all the tufts where they're going to be really seen. They're going to be kind of hidden by buildings and stuff, it's a bit of a waste. So these cost me uh, sort of between 12 and 15, depending on the, the length and the, the colour and stuff. Uh, and that's for a, a pack of a hundred tufts. Uh, these are all Pico. Oh god, he's tearing apart. I might use my fingers. He's a bit bigger one. And the, the great thing about the Pico brand is um, often the packets of tufts that you'll get are um, lots of different sizes. You can see, you know, you get some smaller ones, some bigger ones. Um, there's a good example of that. Here's an unopened packet. So they're not all exactly the same size. They're fairly uniform. Often you can get ones that have really small, like graduating up to massive tufts. They're great sizes as well. But even their kind of more uniform packages um, aren't very uniform, which is awesome because that's what makes terrain look like terrain and not realistic stuff is when everything's too uniform. Um, Alright, I'm going to jump into this for a bit, and then we'll come back and have a look at the, the rest of the tufts and the grassing. Alright, so all our tufts are in. We've got a nice spread of colour that kind of graduates through the board. So now, uh, the last stage of our grassing is to move on to applying our various static grasses with our static grass applicator. Now, I've got uh, two different kind of colours and sizes, and then a bit of a mix. Uh, we're running a 2mm uh, Dead Winter, uh, also by Pico, uh, which is kind of a bit more of a yellow. It sort of matches the, um, the meadow grass tufts, uh, which works quite well because that's our primary colour. And I've also got a, uh, a bit of a darker green, uh, which is uh, in 4mm, and that's the spring 4mm. So now all our tufts are 10 mil and 6 mil. Uh, so they're nice and tall, so the imperative thing, sort of like we talked about in the last video, is just to make sure that all our grasses uh, create a good contrast ratio. So by using the 2mm and the 4mm grasses, that'll give us good low coverage, allowing our tufts to sit up nice and high. So it's all pretty simple to apply. Uh, we just put down PVA wherever we want it, and then we hit it with the static grass applicator. Uh, let me just grab a brush. Alright, so I've got a couple of brushes of different sizes, small one for getting in cracks and a, a slightly larger one. Um, don't really, you don't have to use awesome brushes, obviously get, they're going to get covered in PVA so they're going to get pretty messed up if you don't wash them out, and I always forget. Uh, one thing I can't stress enough is use good quality PVA, use wood glue, not like white crap cheap store glue. Um, it just oh, it means your board's going to last longer, the bonds are really strong, um, often better quality PVAs dry harder and faster quicker as well so you get a, a better working time to keep putting on those layers because stuff doesn't get vacked up. So what you want to be doing is putting, not covering everything because you want it, you want some of that gravel and dirt and all that kind of tone to uh, to carry through because uh, you know it, in, in the case of creating that sort of step landscape it's all uneven and there's roots and dirt and patches, everything's really patchy because it's, it's, it's almost quite arid and uh, the, the type of landscape doesn't get a ridiculous amount of water so um, you, you don't get that really full kind of forest grass coverage. So that's a, that's a decent enough little spot for our example. Now I'll start with the, uh, the 2mm, the shorter grass, just because it's our primary colour and pour it into the top of the static grass applicator. As you can see, there's a mesh there. It's a pretty simple tool. There's a battery inside. Um, it applies a current uh, to the mesh. And then here's my other earth, and we just create a static charge across the static grass fibers as they fall out of the applicator. So as you can see, they come tumbling out. Now, the longer the grass is, the uh, more charge they get. So often you'll find that the two millimeters uh, don't stand up 
as tall, but that you know works quite well for our purposes to be honest. Um, they stand up enough to look nice and grassy, uh, but it also allows uh, us to really maintain that awesome contrast ratio that we're looking for. Uh, so now we'll wait for that section of PVA to dry and then we'll vacuum all of that spare stuff up and we'll get left behind that beautiful little patchy stuff that you know we've had on the first board. So you guys uh, can see that in a bit. I'll start hitting the rest of the board with grass and we'll move on from there. Alright, so I've just backed up our uh, excess from the, uh, the 2mm grass. Now it's definitely you know, still wet, there's PVA kind of all over the place, and sometimes you'll accidentally suck up a bit of the fibres you've already put down out of the PVA, but that's okay because it just frees up more space in that PVA to hit it with a different colour and really blend together those layers. Um, traditionally what you do is you use a layering spray to um, kind of spray your set static grass and glue it back down but with this kind of setup where we've got so many areas that we don't want hit by the layering spray I prefer to just use basically a series of PVA layers and circles by vacuuming it while it's wet you can build layers of fibers by changing color in between each thing and then going back in amongst all of the existing layers and just hitting it with more PVA. Swap now to the 4mm fibres, which uh, I don't know if you can see that there, but they're, they're significantly longer. Well, they're double, aren't they? 4, 2, yeah, no. Um, and you might be able to see that uh, they stand up a hell of a lot better, um, which just gives the grass, you know, a really nice, get out of there, dynamic feel. So here we'll go, we'll get that charge. Yeah, I mean, look at that, there we go there standing right up into that stuff. And what they'll do now is they'll fall into all this new PVA that I've put down, and they'll also fill in the gaps from uh, any of the PVA that I put down for the two millimeter stuff. So what I'm doing here with my left hand is I'm just uh, creating the opposite point for the current to create that, uh, that field, that the charge will apply across the fibre. Just make sure when you're vacuuming up all your different fibres that you do empty it before you vac up a new colour, otherwise you've mixed it all together. Which isn't a bad thing because sometimes you can get a nice mix uh, which I have here actually, this is a mix of two and four uh, from vacuuming up stuff that's had so many layers on it, it all gets mixed together and that can be quite useful to use as a, as a layering tool um, but it's also handy to keep your colours separate. So the gatehouse in the lower city of Edoras is finished. My first board of Edoras, hopefully a few more on the horizon. Uh, a huge consideration for me kind of going into this project was how to balance uh, the playability of the board with, you know, really capturing the spirit of the location. Obviously with Mount Sunday, it's an incredibly kind of sloping sort of surface and, and the way that Edoras clings up the hill towards Metaseld at the crest of Mount Sunday is, is really cool, but it's also quite difficult to capture from a, a wargaming point of view in terms of play. Ability. So this kind of the idea to kind of do a bit bit of a sloping tier, starting at one thickness and, and moving up to three sheets of uh, of extruded polystyrene for the back of the board. I'm really happy with how that turned out. It's the, the front section of the board with the barrows is really beautiful and the way that kind of flows on and I've continued it in this second section, um, it's yeah, I think it makes for some really dynamic gameplay and it really captures the spirit of that sloping city. Um, I'm really happy with the way the buildings kind of nestle in. I've managed to find that, again, that balance between having them be completely removable so that I can use them in other elements, um, but also having them kind of really fitted within the slope of this board so it looks as good as it can be, um, obviously. Having all of these removable roofs makes for incredibly dynamic and exciting gameplay. 
Um, one thing that I will say is certainly still on the horizon is these buildings are not fully interior. You know, there are certainly some finer details that I, I do want to complete with this board. Namely, you know, maybe some, some more heraldry and some details and, and some Rohan banners and, and a bit of that kind of village life. I've got a few of my little trade carts in here from my Osgiliath board just for a bit of something. But there's certainly more to be done here for sure. I wouldn't say she's 100% done, but she's definitely ready for a playable standard and that is super exciting. Uh, this, the, the armory I think is definitely a real highlight, the way I've managed to kind of uh, combine verticality across both, halv both halves of the board, obviously with the wonderful first half that we saw in the last video and we can see here before us, we've got all of these tall elements and these stairs to move up so we get that kind of, not just the slope but also these tiered elements of gameplay which really create kind of a, a cool dynamic, especially for, you know, nice shooty armies, giving some places for archers to fire on down, and, and, and the back sort of half of the board initially in my designs was missing that, so I think this this tower kind of system, and, and it just sort of, it, yeah, gives it that extra bit of landscape, I mean, I can imagine, you know, archers firing across at each other, I think we'll find that's just within range, if uh, Uruks take the gatehouse and the last, you know, Rohan defenders are hunkering at the top of the board, so there's, yeah, there's huge scope for all sorts of great missions, great scenarios, and, and also just for like normal everyday kind of gaming, you know, the board can be played that way rather than, you know, so it's not just a siege mode, it's, yeah, I think it's going to be really fun to play and, and quite a flexible sort of uh, gaming surface. So I'm super, super stoked with how it came out. I learned heaps of new skills on this board, the grass tufts, I improved my carving skills in terms of rock work, and obviously, you know, the lots and lots of balsa, I'm getting better and better at building those buildings as well. So it's always good to grow as a terrain creator and as a war gamer when every, every time you build one of these projects and it's also nice to see, you know, really beautiful terrain be realised and, and really be executed as well as I think I could have done. So I'm super stoked with it, I hope you guys really liked it, if you did, please let me know in the comments, your feedback and your suggestions, you know, from one board to the next has been a huge part of this build process and just the channel in general, it's awesome hearing from you guys, like, subscribe, all that stuff, please hang around, I've got heaps more cool SPG boards on the way, as well as some really cool gameplay and all the other gaming content that we've got here on the channel. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I'll see you next time on Zorbazorb Gaming.